Hey everyone, you are listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast. We are two neurodivergent mental health professionals in a neurotypical world. I'm Patrick Cassell. And I'm Dr. Neff. And during these episodes, we do talk about sensitive subjects, mental health, and there are some conversations that can certainly feel a bit overwhelming. So we do just want to use that disclosure and disclaimer before jumping in. And thanks for listening. Hey, everyone, you're listening to another episode of the Divergent Conversations podcast. Today, we've got a wonderful guest on a good friend and colleague, Dr. Tara Holmquist. She is a PsyD in California, lives in Wisconsin. And today we are going to talk about PDA. So Tara, thank you so much for coming on and just share a little bit about who you are. Yeah. And thank you again for having me. Megan, very, very nice to meet you. I'm excited about today. I'm excited about this experience. So um, as far as my neurodivergence, um, definitely ADHD. Uh, I am about 90% sure that uh, I'm autistic as well. Um, so I'm sort of late identify, still exploring, but pretty sure. And as of late, I've really been ex- like exploring and excited and learning about the PDA profile. So um, I thought we could have some conversations about that today, our experiences and just, you know, the difference between just having demand avoidance and actually like a PDA profile, what that looks like, you know, as an adult, really, as adult AFAB. Um, for me. Cool. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Megan, who this is her wheelhouse for sure, to kind of give the listeners, if you don't know what PDA means or what that looks like, a brief overview. um, And then we'll kind of jump into why we're doing this podcast today too. Yeah. So PDA, it has historically stood for pathological demand avoidance, which again, I mean, so many of these things are defined by what the outside observer might see. And so that's a classic definition from the outside. A person with PDA is going to have a lot of um, demand avoidance. I prefer the term, oh, my brain is foggy today. I would know who coined it. it (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, yeah, pervasive drive for autonomy. I was trying to think of, I think it's an Australian person perhaps who coined the term, um, a PDA. -er, And I really like that that term, the pervasive drive for autonomy, because that captures the internal experience. It's anything that comes at the person that threatens autonomy invokes an extreme fight flight response. So we really have to see this through a lens of nervous system, through stress response, which is what makes it so different than something like oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder, which is often what, especially these kids um, get diagnosed with typically is something like opposition defiant disorder but it's their bodies are going into fight flight mode, sometimes freeze mode. So we also talk, can talk about internalized PDA versus externalized PDA. Um, And it's, it's, I think conceptualizing it through anxiety and then fight flight is a really helpful way of understanding these children and these adults. Increasingly, we're seeing more and more adults talk about PDA, which I'm also super interested in. I have a ton of demand avoidance. I, my, I'm a parent to a PDA, PDAer, so I don't feel like I. There's things that I don't relate to about the full PDA profile, but I think most autistic people have a ton of demand avoidance. So I'm really also interested in teasing out that conversation, kind of like you were saying, Tara, about like what's demand avoidance, what's PDA, how do we tell the difference? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tara, you. To, oh, go ahead. We're going to find ourselves in this today where this instead is going to have loop, we'll either <laughs> have like a uh, like robotic, like you talk, you talk, you talk, or we'll talk over each other. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's going to happen today. Yep. Like I'm just going to dominate everything. Good. <laughs> I'm glad I wanted to use this episode for like exposure therapy in a way for Tara. Tara is a good friend and DM'd me about like what you were experiencing. That's why I wanted to have you on. And do you mind sharing? Like, I don't know if you remember the specific example that you gave me. But what's happening for you when you're like, oh, shit, this is something I really associate with. This is something that's starting to make a lot of sense. And, and you're starting to conceptualize it through that lens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember the specific thing. But now that I'm thinking about it kind of all the time, it's like, oh, it could be any example. But I guess for me, what I've 
what, you know, I had a client that was talking to me about, um, you know, like shame and guilt and stuff like that. And, and she was saying, this is why I do everything so fast all the time, because like, I just don't feel worthy of taking up space or whatever. And I was like thinking about that for a while and then starting to apply that to me because that's historically and everybody that knows me in person will laugh because I'm constantly like I'm running around doing everything. I'm running wherever I go. I have to do everything as fast as possible. All of the things that it's on my to-do list is going to get done in like one microsecond because I just have to. So I started thinking about my experience and I'm like, it's not, it's not a worse thing for me, but it's an extreme discomfort for me. Anytime that I am in that I am expected to do something, even if it's just feed myself or step away from whatever task I'm doing right now. Anytime that I have that, it's like extreme discomfort in my body around having to do something, whatever it is. And so the way that I've coped with that or the way that I've kind of understood it is just like, just get it done as fast as possible so that I don't, I could just sit down on the couch and stare at the wall type saying, you know, that I'm just like, just do it. And and then it's like a loop. It, this is my constant experience where I'm just like having to do something, feel extremely anxious about it, go do the thing as fast as possible, and then go sit down and wait for the next thing to happen that I have to do. And then go repeat, 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 repeat forever. So Tara, I'm smiling because I'm having a memory from my summer before I went into my doctoral program. Um, I was kind of loosely connected to the program. So I was able to find all the syllabi from the program. And what I did, I ordered all of my textbooks and I ferociously read cover to cover all of my textbooks. We're talking about thousands of pages yeah. for my first semester of grad school during the summer before I even started the program. And it was kind of what you're just, what you're describing is the idea of having a task on my plate was so anxiety inducing that it was like, I'm going to do this as fast as possible. And, and then I can rest. Yeah. And and it totally stole my summer, right? Because it's like, I cannot rest until this is done. And that becomes a loop for me of, I, I, I work through my tasks really quickly because it's like, there's this fantasy. Once this is done, then I can rest. But of course, life doesn't work like that because, yep. you know, bodies need maintenance and work keeps coming. But that's absolutely the fantasy. Do you, do you relate to that? I felt like I heard some of that when you were talking. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, constantly. And it, and I don't even know at this point what rest feels like, right? Because I'm not even resting when the task is done. It's just, okay, what's going to be the next thing, you know? And, and depending on who it's going to come from, because internally I can manage my own tasks that I set for myself, feeding myself or doing work, going to see clients, whatever. But if my partner calls me or one of the kids calls and is like, Hey, can you start the oven for me so I can throw in a pizza? I'm like, you know, just totally <laughs> dysregulated. And I'm like, I hate my life. And I, no, I can't. Mm -hmm. So yes, 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 yes. Very much, very much resonate with that. And, and question myself a lot because then when I go to explore kind of like demand avoidance in general, right? When I go to explore this, you know, watching the the master mastermind or whatever that you did with Dr. Henderson, like, I'm like, oh, that's not my experience of like outward, you know, on the out, it looks like you're oppositional. It looks like you're just mm -hmm. defying all of these things. But on the outside, I'm like, I'm getting everything done all the time. Yeah. Like I'm yeah. constantly going inside and I'm struggling though. Inside it's, it's torture. Yeah. Yeah. So can, can I put you on the spot a little bit? Yeah. Um, clinically. <laughs> So I'm, I'm curious how, or if you, if you can tease apart, like what is difficulty with task switching versus demand? I keep hearing you say it's like the demand of go do the oven. We know task switching is hard for ADHD and autistic brains, right? That switching from I'm in flow. You're now asking me to like get out of hyper-focus or out of hyper-fixation and shift tasks. Can you tell the difference between like what is task switching struggle and what is like, this is a demand coming in that I wasn't expecting that is, you know, threatening my autonomy? Ooh, that's a good question. I think, I think in the moment and if I'm in it, I can tell the difference. It feels different for me. Um, I will say this, anything that is not 
something that I'm currently obsessed with is a task for me. And yes, yes. You know what I, really I mean? So, yeah. so yeah. So if I'm pulled away from Ted Lasso or if I'm pulled away from Schitt's Creek, if I'm pulled away from scrolling through TikTok because I'm just, you know, resting or whatever, anything is considered a task for me. And so, and when it becomes something that I now have to do, that's when it starts to feel like, uh, that's when the anxiety starts coming in of like, I don't want to, I don't want to at all. And, um, and then it takes a lot of energy for me to get up and do it. So it, it kind of merges. I can tell the difference. I don't really know how to articulate it though, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it, I and that, that's what I was curious about because you're both like, you have the experience and then you're a clinician. I, I was curious if you were able to tell that subtle difference. Yeah. Um, I think I could also tell the subtle difference, but I don't know that I'd be able to articulate it either. Yeah. Yeah. It's just something, it's just a feeling, feeling in my body mm -hmm. of like stress. Yeah. I don't know. It's just like a stressful feeling. It's, it's a frustration when I have to switch tasks and I'm pulled away from something I mm -hmm. love to do. You know, I love to do. It's a frustration and it's like, okay, get it done. But as soon as like I perceived it as an expectation, then it's like, oh, oh, now I'm going to throw a tantrum while I'm doing it. I'm still going to do it. I'm still going to get it done, but I'm going to be puffing and puffing and like agitated about it while it's mm -hmm. happening. And mm -hmm. then, and then I don't know if I can even get back into Shit's Creek or Ted Lasso or whatever the hell else I'm doing because now I'm waiting for the next thing. I think that captures it well. I think I experience more frustration if it's a demand coming from someone else. If it's a task switch, I feel more pressure. Like I've got to finish this before I can like mentally kind of evacuate the space and go to another one. So like panic versus frustration. And I would say in my case, irrational frustration at the person oh, yeah. requesting the demand. <laughs> yeah. Tara, you mentioned to me when we were first talking about this, like a visceral reaction, because I think it was, uh, I'm remembering the example now, like, I think it was like furniture shopping or something like that. And then, or some type of shopping with mm -hmm. your partner. And then all of a sudden that got canceled. And then it was so hard to switch into like mindset of let's go get a drink or let's go do something else. And because you had already built up the mental energy to say, I'm going to do this thing that I don't want to do. And now because the task is switching, I have such a avoidance to what's coming up and it's going to come up viscerally and it's going to come up physically and I'm going to get really irritated and really frustrated about this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for reminding me because now I totally remember it. And that like I attribute more to like I have the intense need for sameness. Like my routine is set. I already know what I'm doing. And if you're going to change that on me, don't do it five minutes before, you know, so so the situation was we were supposed to go to a soccer game. My partner is the coach of his son's soccer team. We're supposed to have a soccer game, games at one o'clock, whatever. We're going up, we're waiting for it, waiting for it, waiting for it. And then literally like a half an hour before we were supposed to be there for the game, the other team canceled for weather. Okay, nothing we can do about it. Fine, it's fine, it's fine. So we kind of sat there for a minute and then all of a sudden it was like, okay, well, we have time now. Let's go. Let's go grab the furniture that we wanted to buy. And immediately I like lost my shit. <laughs> I was like, I'm not prepared for this. Like, even though we'd been talking about it for weeks, we just needed to find a time. I was like, I'm not prepared for this. I did. I had like a totally like visceral response of like, but just anxiety. And, and I attributed that to like just pulling me out of my, my routine, my structure of what I had going on, you know, and I mean, I have that paralysis when that happens anyways. Like I wasn't doing shit until up into the game. Like, nope, I have to sit here because the game is at one and I, I, I can't do anything until the game is over. I've done, I've watched and cheered as much as I can and then we can go do furniture. But now that you've changed this on me, it was like, it was really, really difficult to even regulate that after that, you know, and, and we did it. We bought the thing, but I didn't have a good time. It was a... I don't know. It was a, it was a hard transition for me as most things like that are. And we all have, all three of us have the, the unique perspective of being mental health workers and trained in regulation and techniques and, and strategies. So it's interesting, you know, when we're experiencing it ourselves, when this stuff is coming up and then we're like shutting down or melting down, so to speak. And then we have to re-regulate and figure out a way to, to, be able to 
push through to do the things that we don't expect to do or don't want to do. And like Megan mentioned, the transition switches are so challenging, especially unexpectedly. And I imagine, you know, if we're going to frame this for like kiddos and teens and young adults who are not mental health workers or don't have the language or don't have the skill set, that that is where we would see the misdiagnosis of ODD or the things that come up and, and where all of a sudden it's like, we need behavioral modification here because this person can't, you know, switch from these tasks or when this is placed upon them, they melt down or, or shut down. Yeah, 100 percent. Or And, you know, one of the interesting things that came up and, and maybe this is the similar conversation that you had with our mutual friend, Patrick, um, around the intersection of like trauma and PDA or even just like, you know, there was three of three things that we were talking about, like masking and, and, and trauma, your trauma triggers and then like PDA stuff. So my experience, and this is where I get confused and, you know, wonder about what this looks like as an adult versus what we see as with kids is like demand avoidance or even the PDA profile is, is so focused on like outward outward behaviors, right? Or outward experiences of, of, you know, the kid that's going to sit in the therapist chair and go, I'm a therapist today and I'm the boss and you're not, you know, all of those things. Like I, I love that. But for me and like my trauma history is I was raised very, very, very hyper independent. So like I do everything for myself all the time and I do everything for everyone else. Like I'm super, super hyper independent and there's a trigger around like, if I don't do everything, I get in trouble in some way. If I don't, if I cause anybody to, you know, question my behavior, question something, then immediately I did something wrong and, and I'm in trouble, right? So I learned at a very young age to just do, just take care of it, figure it out, take care of it, rely on myself, do all of these things. So you're never going to see me outwardly defying anything. You know, as soon as somebody gives me a suggestion or an expectation or demand or tells me to do anything, I'm doing it right away. And you're never going to see me from the outside and go, you know, she's having trouble. You'll, you'll never know. But internally, I'm dying inside. You know, internally, I'm like, I don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. I don't want to do any of this stuff. Like now it's expected of me because of how I've coped with, you know, emotional neglect, how I coped with not getting all of my needs met, you know, when I was a child that, it, you know, this hyper independence is not actually me being like, I don't need help, self-reliance and all of that. It's like, actually, I need a lot of help and stop telling me to do stuff. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely relate to that. So I think like, that's, it's a struggle, especially when you are still managing to get everything done because if people don't see the other side of it, of how much energy it's taking um, and how much um, sensory overwhelm it's ca causing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm curious about your thoughts on that, Megan. Yeah. Um, I had thoughts and then they flew away. Um, I, I was just thinking about, I think I was thinking how adaptive it is if, if your trauma environment was one of kind of over-reliance um, how and if so much of your energy was going to your own survival how any demand on top of that would just be like are you kidding me yeah. and how i mean what a kind of brilliantly adaptive response to your to your environment fair fine will be nice to myself <laughs> it was adaptive and also yeah exhausting. and well that's the thing right like those yeah. things that help us survive like non-ideal environments stop being adaptive when we're adults and that's right right that's why we exist as therapists <laughs> that's right that's, that's right true. that's yeah. true megan for you and your end you mentioned like you know sharing some of these tendencies and traits with the pda profile and, and having a kiddo who does as well who's a pda or what does that look like for you on your end yeah yeah i mean tons of and this i think i and maybe i get a little bit picky here I think what I'm noticing, at least in social media, I feel like people are conflating demand avoidance with PDA. And so that's where I like mm -hmm. to be a little bit specific with my language of like having parented a PDA -er and like experienced a very 
visceral experience around parenting that like I can tell, okay, what I'm experiencing de- demand avoidance, this is different. Um, and so that's where, yeah, I definitely relate to a lot of the demand avoidance and the internalization. I'm very similar to you, Tara, in that it's on the outside. Like someone says jump, I'm like, how high? Although that's actually not always true. Like I, I, I'm, I've been recently working through some shame on this of, I was collaborating with a colleague. We were going to do some public speaking. And I realized that public speaking is where my demand avoidance just goes full throttle. Like I will fantasize about getting sick. I will try to figure out how in the world to get out of it. Like I'll, I'll often commit to public speaking because I'll be excited for the first 24 hours when someone reaches out. And then I will have so much demand avoidance that it makes me actually pretty flaky. Um, so I've decided to stop saying yes to public speaking mm-hmm. for the next year, just to see like, what's that like? Cause I, I will for months and months and months have so much um, anguish around it and I'll, I'll procrastinate, which isn't common for me. Um, so that is one place where professionally I really notice my demand avoidance causing some, um, some tension, but then otherwise, yeah, a lot of the internal experiences of, I do a lot of tricks to get myself to do things um, it's interesting just hearing other people talk about the internalized PDA. It's one of those moments where it's like, I thought everyone did this. Like I thought everyone tricked yeah. themselves into kind of multitasking or doing these things or making it a game to get themselves to actually do the thing. Um, but yeah, I spend a lot of mental energy if it's something outside of my interest. Um, I have, I, th- I think it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm shifting away from clinical work and right now two of my five days in a week, I don't have any demands on me unless I'm placing them. I have a lot of work to do. I have a lot of writing. I have a lot of content to create, but those days feel so different to me um, because I'm waking up and it's demand free. It's whatever I want to do. And so I am moving towards structuring my life more and more that way. Cause it just works better for me. Yeah. That sounds like a dream. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you doing five days of clinical work? Uh, it's like four and a half. My Mondays, I like done such a good job of like, my Mondays are dedicated to me, but now I've started to fill up my Mondays with doing ADHD and autism evaluations and like absolutely love doing it, but absolutely hate writing reports. I was going to say that is a big demand. I, it is. I, I have a mixed relationship to assessments too. I love it. And we need so many more assessors and the report it's, that's a big demand. It is. And that's why I'm still sort of, you know, Patrick's always like, let's go whenever you're ready to go into it. Like we're going to support you. We'll go full force. And I'm like, I don't know, because I just, I just, I love doing it. I love meeting with people. I I love the assessment part. And then, yeah, it's just that writing part that I'm just like, well, can I just tell you, like, can I just tell you instead of writing all this stuff down? (laughs) Like, just, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, sense. I know this isn't a consult call, but you probably could, like for people who aren't looking for accommodations, you probably could find a way to make a much briefer report and then do more of it verbally, depending on what they're needing. Yeah. I have someone actually next week that we had that conversation mm-hmm. and they were like, you know, I don't necessarily want it written down anywhere, but I, I do want to explore this and like, what are our options? So we're yeah. going to talk about that. I'm seeing more and more people wanting that they're wanting confirmation, but they're not wanting it medically anywhere, yep. which kind of makes sense to me there. Yeah. That's, that's your, that's your demographic. That's your like <laughs> ideal client and people who want the like, yes, I anoint you as a psychologist with this diagnosis, but I'm not going to medically put it anywhere. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, it's just good. Like you want to meet if, like, if you're able I... to just anoint people with these things and then <laughs> yeah. like, you know, validate support, we don't have to, you know, I think that speaks to this profile in a way, right? Like the demand for, I have to write this report, but I absolutely don't fucking want to for a myriad of reasons. And then I I noticed that myself for so many things. And I, what I hear you saying, Megan, is like really creating a schedule in your life where it's much more flexible in terms of demands and demands that are put on you. And if they're going to be there, they're demands that you put on yourself. And I know that not everyone has the privilege to do that with their schedule or create around it, but 
I do think that's a great strategy for people who are listening, who need some relief for some, from some of this stuff is to figure out ways to lessen the load of demands that are coming on you from, from other people and less that you're putting on yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Tips, strategies, techniques, anything that we can offer the audience about, you know, when they're struggling or when they're experiencing anything like this that we're talking about. What, what I mean, similar to what we were just talking about, I think if, again, if someone has, like, if this is accessible to a person, having one day a week that is demand free, um, and, and it could be a weekend day, right? But just the relief of, like, my, my daughter and I will both talk about this, like the relief when we wake up, and it's like, it is an open day, there are no demands, uh, having at least one day a week, where I, I think that's really um, soothing. And, and to be able to depend on it too. Yeah. Even, so. even the idea of, of like, oh, we, like it's a free weekend, right? And like even the thought of, oh, maybe we'll go to dinner later on Saturday mm -hmm. night or something like that. If that's planned on Friday night, that's not a free day for me on Saturday. You know, yes. it's, like, it's not an open day for me. Yes. I'm like, All right. I'm going to do nothing uh -huh. literally until whatever time dinner is going to uh -huh. be, you know? So are you like this? I'm very much like this, like spontaneous socializing. I cannot make plans with people. Otherwise it's, there's something on my day. So if I'm trying to connect with someone on the phone or see someone that doesn't happen much anymore, but it's gotta be like, Hey, are you free right now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, even scheduling this, right. It was like, okay, here's your options for this. And I'm like, I just want to say no to all, like, Mm -hmm. First of all, I should say like reactionary for anything. I say no, first of all, you know, Tara, can you turn on the oven for me now? Can you do, <laughs> so everything is no, even though I'm going to get up and do it, but absolutely like scheduling even this uh, time to talk, it was like, okay, I'm going to do it in the middle of my clients. I mean, it was limited time mm -hmm. anyway, but like, I'm going to do it in the middle of my clients so that I can't get out of it. I can't say you know, yes, I'll do it. And then, and then finding some mm -hmm. excuse on a Saturday to not do it. Absolutely. Like it has to be now or never and preferably never, but mm -hmm. now. <laughs> well, that, that's another good strategy is packing demands. Like my same thing with Patrick, when we started this podcast, I was like, well, Tuesday is my busy clinical day. So let's do it Tuesday to record. Cause it's like, it's a demand day. And if I, that means that my Wednesday can tend to be low demand, but by packing my demands, like that's one strategy. And it sounds like you kind of did that too. Yeah. Without even knowing. Mm -hmm. I have to do that with scheduling stuff, like scheduling my own stuff. I'm fine with it, but I notice every time I schedule someone else's podcast or someone else's speaking engagement or someone else's anything, I'm like rescheduling, 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 pushing it back, pushing it back, pushing it back. Mm -hmm. And there is a part of my brain that's like, just fucking get it done. But I don't want to. So then I just, I can't. And I've rescheduled on the one person in particular that I'm thinking about right now, poor like conversation about like, come on my podcast, be a guest. And every time I pick a time, I'm like, I don't want to do that that day. I don't want to do that at that time. Like, so I just, now it's in August and I'm sure once we get to August, it'll now become October and it'll just never happen. And I'm, I'm sorry if you're listening. I, I <laughs> Do you all do that fantasy thing where it's like in August, I will want to do this, like, or this won't be <laughs> yes. a big deal. So I, I'll commit to things. So like the speaking thing I mentioned that I then got out of, but I also had things out as my plate since then, but um, it was like, oh, in, in September, like I'll be this whole new person who would like, would love to do public speaking and it never happens. But the fantasy always stays that, you know, four months from now, I will, I will just, you know, love that demand but a hundred percent or or right now like i always take the the week between christmas and new year's off and here we are like almost in june and i'm like oh dude that week is gonna be so good i'm gonna like i'm gonna come back to the new year just a whole new person it's like, such a fucking lie to you <laughs> it's just totally. i get caught up in the romanticized idea of that and I don't know if y'all relate, but I think you do because I saw you both like nodding in agreement when Tara was talking about something, but like rushing from demand to demand or task to task to get them over with, to give yourself like breathing room. I'm always telling myself like, once I get this done or once I created this thing, 
I can finally breathe and like have nothing to do. And that never happens. And that feels like this internalized torturous pressure of like, I just want to disappear from all of this. But when could that actually? Yeah. Happen? Disappearing mm-hmm. fantasies. I've had that since I was a child, like yeah. where, oh, this sounds so morbid. It sounds so I morbid. Um, I used to, I don't have this fantasy as much since realizing I'm autistic and adapting my life, but like but fantasizing that everyone I knew. This is- <laughs> you can say it. You can say it. We should always run it out. Oh my gosh, that everyone I knew died. And then I was like starting over nowhere with no expectations on me, no demands on me. And I think part of that was the mask of like, I could actually be myself if everyone who ever had known me didn't exist. Or if like I moved to another country, that's a much less morbid fantasy, just me. But then I'd live with the guilt of like having left and moved to another country. Um, but it, it was about a demand avoidance and about like authenticity of I can't actually be my authentic self until everyone I've ever like touched in my life as a human doesn't have like a known history of me in their memory you're you're really hoping for like the thanos finger snap (laughs) and then half of those people are just gone gone yeah Yeah. obviously not a real fantasy but maybe they could still exist but just their memories are white it's like a men in black thing yeah yeah yes yes i i can relate to that i think that there is this fantasy of starting over or just not having anyone know anything and you can just start Mm -hmm. naturally Mm -hmm. i think maybe that feels like a common fantasy for a lot of neurodivergent people who have struggled so significantly with social struggles and just the day-to-day lived experience of what it's like to live inside a body with a nervous system that Mm -hmm. we have Mm -hmm. i mean what i'm hearing all of us say is that a lot of just getting through life is really fucking challenging and we're constantly figuring out ways to do things so that we can get through another day and that it's exhausting and it's a different type of exhausting than like a neurotypical person saying counting down the days to that beach trip and that's going to rejuvenate me it's like we don't really have an escape i think that's what we're saying yeah yeah i even like rest and relax in private if that makes sense Mm -hmm. like i'll do you know all of the things that i'm supposed to do and expected of and that's my role in my family and my life and everything blah blah blah. i'm a therapist then i'm whatever and then and then as soon as i have like a unexpected break in my day or something like that like i run over into my bedroom shut the door because my kid lives downstairs (laughs) for one more day and and so I'm like, oh, I don't want anyone to see me like rusting. I don't want, because I'm hiding away because immediately as soon as I don't have something to do, somebody's going to ask me to do something. Or there's like a a shame in resting. And I think that's part of my trauma stuff is like there's a shame in not doing something all the time mm-hmm. or making sure that someone's okay all the time. So I'd rather hide away in my room with my snacks and my TikTok or whatever and and like pretend you know like i don't exist to anybody right now everyone thinks that i'm doing something else so it's kind of similar to what you're saying megan it's just like i can be exactly myself unmasked and just no demands on me whatsoever and i could just literally stare at the wall like people think i'm joking when mm-hmm. i'm like i just want to stare at the wall for like an hour like i literally just want to stare at the wall yeah yeah well and that's that's an interesting part of it too is I hear a lot of autistic people talk about like how comfortable it is to be home alone because it's not just the not having a demand, but knowing no demands are going to come at me. So like when you go into your room and retreat and it's, it's like, okay, how do I create a bubble where someone doesn't just walk in the room and like um, assault me with a demand. Mm -hmm. So there's, that's an interesting psychological component of it too, is not just there not being demands, but like the, um kind of certainty no demands are going to come at me which is really hard in this world with how kind of interconnected our lives have become with technology patrick and i have talked about this a lot like the incoming pings and pongs like in all these little splinter demands that come at us um it's it's hard to not be assaulted by demands all day long 
It really is. And I think you're so right about that's the beauty of having the ability to work from home is you kind of do get to set your expectations, right? Of like who has access, but you're, uh, Megan just touched on something I wanted to mention for those of you listening, like really figuring out a routine to start your day, because I know I don't do a good job of this where I immediately, as soon as I wake up, check my phone because I put my phone in a different room at night. Cause I have to get away from the, the demands. I also feel like this in, this unbelievable pressure to always be responsive to things. So I check it and immediately it's emails, messages, Facebook messages, Instagram messages, group practice messages, and my my day can be ruined in a matter of seconds. And it really is important to try to figure out a routine and a strategy where you're not doing that immediately to start your day or end your day because there are techniques that we can put in place to to have some distance, even if it's momentarily, like we don't get to just disappear all the time. But if even those momentary blips or rest uh, examples or abilities to just step away even for a minute or two and build on that, I think it is about building on those moments as well. Mm -hmm. And like then really incorporating them consistently, like Megan said, having a day, even if it's a weekend where you just don't schedule anything or you don't check your phone or you don't commit to plans because it's just a day to allow yourself to breathe. And I think that is so crucial. And don't follow my advice of checking your phone first thing in the morning. Cause it's I, no, too late. I, I do the same thing. And I've been learning so much more about like low arousal mornings and like, and like in my, I have this fantasy of like an ideal morning routine, but yeah, I am the same way, Patrick. I, yeah, it's so sad. And then it's a battle, right? Like, okay, I'll go put my phone in the other room, but then the battle is I, I want to go in the other room and check. I got to go in the other room and check because how much is building up, you know? Yeah. I, I've tried so hard. It's so freaking hard. And I think that that's where my, you know, um, PDA kicks in and it's just, I have this inner personal feeling, maybe it's my own trauma history of having to respond and having to clear and having to constantly be like one step ahead. And that goes into my ADHD profile too, of like, I have to do everything immediately or I'm going to fucking forget. Mm -hmm. And that feels like internalized Mm -hmm. pressure constantly because Mm -hmm. it's like, you're so responsive. You responded to this email and this message. I'm like, if I don't, I never will. So like, but Mm -hmm. that feels like, infinite pressure that never ever goes away Um, yeah yeah i love that you tied in the adhd because that also i think wraps into demand avoidance i'm the same way of like i don't trust my mind to remember to do this later so i need i will do it now and it's it's small and big projects like if i'm excited about a big project i like have to get hyper fixated and do it in a week or like send the email right now um because it's just like, it's so hard to get myself to do it later or I'll completely forget. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Schedule send has become my best friend for things like that because like schedule sending emails, schedule sending texts, but I can't do that mm-hmm. on certain platforms where they don't have that as an option. Right. But like where it is an option, it is a lifesaver yeah. because then I'm yeah. like, okay, I can get it out of my head. Mm-hmm. I can get it cleared off mm-hmm. the never ending list. And I don't have to like message someone at 1 a.m. or whatever yeah. Run yeah. their experience. So uh, it, it is a challenge for sure, but that is something that's just been an accommodation that I've had to incorporate. Otherwise, like you said, Megan, like it would be gone or it would never mm-hmm. happen. And that, that just, again, feels like constant pressure. So maybe a different topic, but ultimately definitely a part of the experience for sure. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think it goes in hand in hand. Like I know that when I'm under a certain amount of stress, like my ADHD symptoms are just out of control. And then it's this battle between let me get everything done as much as I can because I'll forget, I will forget. And then I'll do a lot of half things. And what I'm noticing lately, because I've been exploring all of this stuff and like, what would it be like if I just unmasked? Like, what am I actually like? You know? And, and that's when I realized, like, oh, I can't remember shit. Like, I actually can't remember anything. Like, I don't know how I've survived 40 years of my life. I don't know how I became the therapist that I am. Like, I don't know how I do any of this because when I 
when I'm battling, you know, what my mind, what I trust my mind is going to do or not do. Plus exploring like, what would it mean if I didn't have all this avoidance around like these expectations? What, what am I going to be like? And I, so far, I don't like it so much because I'm not very functional, but we're going to learn to adapt. We're, we're going we're gonna to figure this out. Megan, I'm just going to be on your website just all the time. <laughs> just like, what else is she going to say about this? I need help. <laughs> Megan's resources are incredible. They uh, are. So I always, you know, I feel very honored to be co-hosting a podcast with you, Megan, because I'm like, geez, I, I just think everything you're creating and doing and how you're showing up for the ND community is, is really, really amazing. And um, yeah, I think Tara, you know, a lot of over-functioning for executive functioning and deficits and like accommodating and just figuring it out. And, you know, I, I think a lot of neurodivergent folks could have, could relate quite a bit to what you just said. And you're not alone in that. I know I feel that way a lot of the time. I know Megan's mentioned feeling that way a lot of the time, like and it's, it's definitely one of our realities. So um, I think we're at our awkward goodbye space, which is <laughs> something we are figuring out as we go. Um, but I do want to thank you for coming on and, and just being vulnerable enough to share your side of the story and, and how you experience this. I think it'll be very helpful for everyone listening. Yeah, no, I really, really appreciate it. It's been very validating for me. Um, just having you both here and just talking and conversating about this because feel like I'm doing this alone and, you know, just checking people's resources and things and feels lonely. So thank you. Thank you for having me here mm -hmm. experiencing with me. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on and for using one of your like demand spoons to be here. Thank you. That's going to be the episode title, something about demand spoons. Mm -hmm. I like it. <laughs> um, I'm sure we will be linking um, anything Megan has created to the show notes so that y'all have access to it. She does have um, some diagrams on PDA, more information about PDA, um, and just anything in general. So that will be in the show notes as well. Megan, you got anything to add before we awkwardly close this? Um, yeah, I or just regarding resources, I've got a fantastic masterclass up with Dr. Henderson, who is a really wonderful um, neuropsychologist who I would say is one of the specialists in diagnosing PDA. So if you're a clinician looking for like, is this something I diagnose? What are the core features? That's a big, we don't actually diagnose it, but we can't talk about it in the report. Um, then I would say definitely check out Dr. Henderson's work. Um, and I have a master class up that where you can kind of hear more of the clinical definition of PDA. So Perfect. And we'll link all of that in the show notes so you all have easy access to it. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Divergent Conversations on all major podcast platforms and YouTube. Like, download, subscribe, and share. Bye.